All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the last installment of the Industrial Seminar Series. Uh, we're very happy to have two esteemed faculty from the U of M Computer Science Department um, here to talk to you about uh, vision, graphics, all sorts of cool things. So uh, we're very lucky to have them. We're very happy to have them. And first up is Professor Gary Meyer. Thank you, Gary. Go ahead. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, I didn't know I was esteemed. <laughs> I'm going to retire, but I didn't, that makes me esteemed or not. Um, so what I want to tell you about today is a work that I did jointly with my graduate student, Michael Tetzla. So, so one kind of underwriting uh, theme or, or thing that you might take away from this is what do graduate students do? Because I'm going to go pretty much comprehensively through Michael's research and give you a sense of how it evolved over time and all the things that he, that he managed to accomplish as a graduate student. So that's, so that's one kind of side, uh, side thing you might take away from this talk. So um, who, uh, who managed to see the, uh, the Lion King, the recent uh, new version of the Lion King that uh, has been out for this year? OK. And uh, how, many, how many of you thought that the computer graphics simulations were, were realistic, realistically done? Anybody who didn't? Or it seems like most people did, right? So if those of you who thought that they were realistically accomplished. How many of you have sat five foot away from a live lion and inspected them closely? No, no lion tamers in the, in the room, huh? Well, you know, I've, I've seen this movie, and I saw the movie that was, was done prior to it, Jungle Book. Um, it was even though Disney has their, their logo on this, this was actually done by Weta Digital, the, the digital effects. And in fact, a different uh, place other than Disney did the, also did the Lion King. And I, you know, as somebody who's been in the field for quite a few years and has, has seen it go from being able to just render a single or several squares on a raster, primitive raster graphics device to this, you know, it was, you know, it was almost an emotional experience for me to see how far things have come. And I, you know, I also would say I see it as, as realistic. But motion pictures live in a world where they often don't, they're not going to be criticized or they can't be criticized because lots of the things that they render, you have no experience with. You know, if it's a science fiction movie, right, you don't know what the android or whatever it was was supposed to look like. Um, and it, when it comes to things like live animals, you may have seen pictures of live animals, but you've never had the opportunity to spend a whole day observing them. Um, explosions, fires, you know, hopefully. I don't, I've never, you know, seen a live, maybe, a, you know. But, you know, some of those things that you see regularly in the movies, you have no personal experience with. That's not to say that what they, don't, what they do is not technically amazing. You know, they sort of live in a little bit of a fantasy world. Um, on the other hand, there are lots of things, lots of places where pictures get used. In particular, computer graphic pictures get used by, by individuals who have the opportunity to inspect the object that's in the picture. And in fact, they may make multi-million dollar decisions about the design of some object based on the simulation that's done. So the rendering, the realistic and the quantifiably accurate rendering of things, both in terms of geometry and its, and its appearance, are a really important problem in, in computer graphics. And just to give you some ideas of, remind you of things that you know, you're aware of where <coughs> computer graphic renderings play a big role. So, you know, if you see a, a car commercial today, if you watch it on television, you see a, a commercial, 90% of the time, you're not looking at a real car anymore. It's just not cost effective for them to go out and, and do live photography because the car itself in the process of designing it, they produce this big CAD database 
they have all that they need, at least geometrically, to, to render this thing accurately. The problem, actually, is eliminating the stuff that they don't need, all the little screws and nuts and everything that you don't need to see to get that out of the database. Um, here's another, another simulation that was done. You know, the interior of the car, getting the appearance of all those materials to look right, to have them match and look in terms of relative to one another the same way that they're going to look uh, when the car is actually manufactured or when you get in and, and test it out is a big problem for them. Um, the simulation of small product design, this little speaker, you know, what it looks like on the shelf with the indirect lighting. Up in the upper right is kind of exploded CAD drawing of that. Fabrics and garments, you know, today you can go online and buy things. And sometimes what you're looking at in the catalog is at least depicted. Sometimes it could be a graphic rendering. Sometimes it's something derived from pictures. It has to look right when you get it compared to what was you saw in the pictures. <clears throat> Another big category where mechanical, where computer graphics has been used really since the inception of computer graphics is mechanical design. So here you see a, a full, uh, complete, rendered version of something. Here's something that's a little bit more, uh, might, might appear as an illustration in a book that's going to be used in a manual for somebody who's going to maintain this or actually uh, manufacture it. You know, sometimes graphics gets used not only to depict the, the shape and form of something, but also to do various types of analyses prior to its, prior to its construction. Uh, what's the shape and form, the fairness of a surface, the relative positions of shapes and forms in space, all very important aspects of mechanical design. Architectural design is another area where computer graphics is heavily used these days. You know, issues related to siting, you know, the relative appearance of your building relative to others next door, um, the materials that are chosen to, to uh, provide the facade and all the surfaces that are, that are part of that building. All those things have to be rendered correctly in the process of doing the design work so that when the thing actually gets built, you know, it looks the way that you anticipated it was going to look when you're looking at the computer, computer graphic version of that. The last area I want to uh, introduce here and really is going to kind of form the focus. It was the focus, <clears throat> was the application area for the work that we were doing, is uh, cultural heritage preservation. So if you want to, today, you know, you read about situations that exist in the Middle East where you know, various actors have gone in and actually destroyed historic objects. Entire cities, parts of entire cities are just being uh, uh, decimated. And if you want to at least have some record of those sites, or if you're just an anthropologist or an archaeologist wanting to study them, you know, they go out in the field and they acquire data about those sites using computer graphic techniques to do it. Um, here's a group. Uh, cultural heritage imaging, which I've interacted with and know. Um, uh, they're going to acquire information about this object. Here's uh, uh, another example of their work. And this is a good example because it kind of shows up there in the upper left is the object that they were working with. And down there in the lower left is the final result after they did the acquisition process. And so what would you say about comparing the upper left to the lower left? Is there acquisition on the lower left? That's, that's, that's the final result of the imaging process that they used. What would you say about that compared to the upper left? Does it, does it look the same? Hmm? What do you say? Yeah, there's no, it's very, very good. It's very specific. It doesn't look as shiny as the thing on the upper left, right? 
And that's a, that's a result of the software that they're using. And in fact, part of the work that we've been doing is to, as you'll see as we go through it, is to really improve this result, to make this thing, the final result, look more like what's in the upper left. It's kind of, in a nutshell, the whole point of the work that we were doing. OK, so you know, I make no assumptions here that you know any computer graphics, which is, I think, reasonable. And so this is going to be kept at a fairly high level. I'm not going to get down into the real details and the mathematical details necessarily of what we did. But you know, I, I assume that you know, we have to at least give everybody a foundation from which to work from. And so if you do know some computer graphics, you know, please excuse this rather simplistic uh, walkthrough. But I think it's important. So what does it take to make a computer graphic picture? So the, the first thing is you got to have some geometry, right? You have to have a thing of some kind. And you have to know its shape and its form. And then the second thing is you need to decide what kind of material properties it's going to have. How does light reflect from that surface? So you need to know what its reflectance properties are. Not only its kind of basic color, but how does light scatter from the surface? Is it a dull surface? Is it a shiny surface? Does it have a pattern and a texture to it? All those things go into the, 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 the modeling of that thing, not only in terms of its shape and form, but also its reflectance. And really, in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, it's, it's primarily focused on these two steps. You know? while, while the latter part of the talk will be about the rendering process and innovations that Michael made to that particular aspect of the rendering process, most of what we're concerned with here is this problem. How do you get the shape, form, and appearance of the object correctly designated? But once you've got those things, then you can proceed to add both the lighting and the camera. So if you're looking at this process and saying, well, that sounds like photography. Well, it is a lot like photography. You know, we have to go do the same things that a photographer has to do to make a good picture has to be done by the person making a computer graphic image. Even how you organize the objects to make the, make the set, you know, make the, the way you've uh, arranged things look nice, you know, that's a part of computer graphics. Where you put the light, how you light the object to make it look good in the picture. And that's a big part of being a good photographer. You know? you can, it takes me a while even to train my students to make them understand you know, that if we're going to develop this algorithm to make things differentially better in appearance, you could lose that whole result you know, if you don't know how to put the lights in the scene correctly. So lighting the thing and then placing the camera here just a viewpoint and a screen, those are all things that are very similar to the photographic process. So once you've got the objects and the lights and the camera, then the process of making the picture you know, amounts to, in this case, we're going to look through an individual pixel. We're going to ask the question, what's behind that pixel? And not all objects can be seen through that pixel. In fact, in this case, only the blue cylinder can be seen. So once we figure that it's hit and it's in the closest thing, there could be other objects behind there that are also in the line of sight, but they're obscured by the cylinder. Once we know that that's the thing that's observable through that pixel, then we do a lighting calculation. We look to the light source, and we ask the question, how is the light interacting with this surface? You know, if I had a flashlight in here, you know, depending on you know, the lights in this room, for example, and the way they, you can look up on the wall and just see how even the, the, the fixtures interact with the surfaces. It's not uniform, you know, right where the light meets the wall. Kind of some parts are obscured from the light and you get a shadow. All those things enter into this lighting calculation and eventually allow you to compute the color of that pixel that's in the middle of the screen there. And ultimately, 
you know, if you did this for all the pixels in the, in the scene, you know, you'd get this kind of picture in the lower right. And hopefully, you know, throughout the rest of this lecture, I'll show you some better, better computer graphic renderings than that. But, you know, for this little simple example, just to get across the principles. So, what's the take from this? I want to go back and, and, and just reemphasize that to get started, you need geometry information and you need reflectance information, okay? So now I'm going to show you, talk about if you were, had this problem of acquiring geometry and reflectance, how might you go about doing that? Okay, so you've got something you want to make a picture of, my pop can, for example. You know, how would I acquire the shape and form of it and the fact that it's got the label and the color and all the rest of it? So you can go out and buy tools to do this. Some of you may have, how many have it connect? So you know what this, this device does. You know, it's got a camera in there, and it also has ability to sense depth. It'll tell you how far away things are from it. But it's, you know, the, while the camera is not bad, in terms of it's a video camera, um, and that kind of lowers its, its quality. And the depth sensing isn't particularly accurate. You know, it's good enough for gesturing and you know, just sensing what kind of motions people are doing, but it wouldn't be very good if you wanted to try and get the geometry of this uh, can. On the other hand, there are other far more sophisticated and expensive devices. This is called a, a structured light device. It puts a pattern on the object and then uses cameras and some stereo cameras to sense the position of that camera. We've got a, a, a turntable that it's sitting on. And ultimately, you can see on the screen, it returns the shape and form of you know, the, the sole of that, device, of that particular piece of footwear. Uh, here's another uh, maybe less expensive device and a little bit more uh, portable. I mean, you can buy gizmos like this that you could you know, I could pull the, whip this thing out and just start scanning the desk and the can and everything, and it would give you a pretty good representation of it. Um, here's a far more sophisticated device. You can see they're working with a very delicate and intricate model there. I think it's a laser-based system of some kind. Um, here's another laser-based system that's used out, uh, outdoors to acquire information about particularly like construction sites, for example. Even uh, uh, archaeologists will take this out and put it on a site of some kind and acquire information about the geometry. Um, finally, this is uh, a thing called the light stage. It was developed at the uh, University of Southern California, Paul DeBevec and his group. This was a, a movie special effects system uh, for acquiring imagery that was then going to be used to do what I'm going to talk about later called image-based rendering. But, you know, it was a, obviously a very uh, complicated device. It's been used. Uh, I can't exact. I, there's been several movies that have made use of this and, and acquired information and data that went into the construction of that movie. You can see live actors moving on the, on the treadmill. Very, very sophisticated device. But what I want to tell you about is how you can accomplish more or less everything that the, all those other devices can do with just a flash camera. Now, this is a pretty sophisticated digital uh, flash camera. Uh, but you know, everybody in this room has got you know, one of these in their pocket, right? You know, so it's, it's reasonable and possible, you know, that you could apply everything I'm going to show you today using your phone and get images that are of the quality that I'm going to show you today with just your phone. And that's one of the reasons that we, we took this approach. Um, was because, because of the fact that it, it could make, it could provide really great results for not a lot of expense and not a lot of sophistication. 
And I'm even, you know, I'm setting aside the fact that today you're starting to see these phones come out with infrared kind of sensors like the Connect had. So you can get some depth information in addition to imagery information. But we're ignoring all that. You know, we're just saying basic flash camera. Okay? So if that's our piece of equipment, how are we going to get geometry and reflectance? That's what we need to make the picture, right? Geometry and reflectance. So what we're going to use to get the geometry is a technique called photogrammetry. Anybody by chance know a little bit about photo? Yeah. So photogrammetry has been a long, around for a long, long time. I mean, since the invention of photography. You can go back into the 19th century and people were using photogrammetry techniques with, from photographs. And the, and the basic idea, as you see depicted here, is you take a bunch of pictures of something. Here this is a, happens to be a, a, a person. You can see along the bottom, if you look carefully, you'll see all the individual pictures that were taken from all the different directions, right? And then you process those pictures, and you get back a geometric representation. And you also get back the textures, the color patterns uh, that you need in order to come up with this kind of three-dimensional depiction of, of this person standing in front of some kind of graphic. So that's, that's the basic idea uh, in a nutshell. And how does it get accomplished? And again, it's not, it's not the emphasis of this talk, and nor is it anything that we innovated on. I mean, we just use some existing tools. There are great tools out there today for doing this, if you're interested. Um, but the, the basic problem that you have to solve in order to do photogrammetry is, given that you have a bunch of pictures, you have to find correspondences between points on those pictures. And this turns out to be the most difficult part of the problem. And there are a number of techniques that involve some computer vision techniques. And it actually turns out to be, you know, you think, well, you're looking for corners and edges and things like that. And it turns out, yeah, they play some role. But it's actually like a statistically based kind of thing that they're looking for. Um, and so you first of all have to find these correspondences. And here's another example of, of correspondences between the head in, in two different poses. So it's a little difficult to see, but one is kind of a top view of this artifact, and the other is more front-on view. And you can see from the lines that are getting drawn by the system that's doing this correspondence finding you know, how it's finding these locations. So once you've, once you've figured out things that are in one picture that are in, in the, is finding those same things in the other picture, or those same points in the other picture, and you know something about the camera itself. In fact, you don't even necessarily have to know this. Some of these, most of these systems actually will figure this out. But you, know, you have to know something about the lens and the focal length of the lens. Um, and once, you, once you've got all that information and the pictures and the correspondences, you can find what are called the camera poses. So where were the cameras located relative to the object? And in this particular case, if you look at the, where the cameras were, it's pretty regular. I mean, I know this group. This is actually a, a group in, in the liberal arts college. Um, you can go use their facility and do this yourself if you're interested. Um, they have a turntable and a really simple gantry system. And they, this is where they got these pictures from. Right, so now you've got the correspondences. You've got the, where the cameras were located. Now the next step is you're going you're gonna to do what's called structured from motion sometimes. And it, it's, it basically, it's a, it's a triangulation problem. You know, if you know, if you, if you, it, it's, it's doesn't, it really doesn't amount to much more than that once you've got the points on the objects figured out. Although there is a fair amount of compli complication and sophistication that has to take place. But in the end, you know, if you sort of appreciate the idea of what, what it would mean to do triangulation amongst you know, several known lines of sight, um, you can figure out where the points are. So you get this big point cloud from this process 
from which you can then build a mesh, a triangular mat, triangle, usually a, a mesh of triangles. And finally, you get this result on the right-hand side where they take and, and map textures onto the surface. Now, if you look at those, if you look at that result and you compare it to, you know, what we started with here, right? Something's been lost <laughs> in terms of appearance, right? So this is, you wouldn't even, you might even have a hard time even recognizing this as a, a metal object, right? I mean, if I just showed you that picture and asked you what material was the elephant made from, you might, you might say, well, it could be porcelain, right? I mean, it could, nothing, nothing about that picture uh, suggests by itself that it's, that it's metal. So they give you, so if you use this product, and we've used it a lot, it's called Agisoft Photoscan. There are others that are available that do the same thing. They largely, what they have to do in order to solve this problem is they have to erase the shininess. The shininess inhibits the, uh, the detection of correspondence points. Those bright highlights uh, inhibit the, the detection of those correspondences. So they erase all that stuff. And then, you know, they only give you back the, the erased textures. Um, as you'll see, you know, it's not that difficult to give you back the, the better, better uh, textures, and that's one of the small contributions we made very early on in this work. But that's the problem here. You know, they're, they're giving you back degraded versions of what was in the original pictures. They give you back great geometry. And they're, if you talk to them, you know, they have so many people who really only care about the geometry. You know, they, they just... They're using photogrammetry. Photogrammetry, it's, it, we, you know, there could be, obviously, there's like entire courses that get taught on this subject. And it's widely used uh, for various purposes, you know, when they're building the, as an example, when they're building the uh, new um, athletic facilities, uh, they flew drones around the building like every couple of weeks as it was being constructed. And the, re the reason they do this is, so that they can make sure that the subcontractors are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> That's what I was told. <laughs> so they can, you know, because there's lots of people working on this building and lots of stories get told about what happened and why something's not done and they can just bring them in and say, look, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is where it was, you know, the day that you said. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's, that's one application of this work. Um, and, and entire buildings, it's, it's, it's an interesting tool. If you're into photography at all, it's something you can actually do yourself without a lot of, a lot of effort. All right, so that's how we get the geometry. Um, so now we're going to talk about how we get the reflectance. How do we get the material appearance properties? And so there have been, you know, if you think about this problem, you know, there are several different ways that suggest themselves for acquiring information about how light interacts with the object. For example, in the upper left, you know, I could set up a static light and move the camera relative to the object. Or, in the upper right, I put the camera in a static position and I move the light around and, and shoot photographs. Or, in the lower left, I do both. I move the camera and I move the light to get you know, a much more comprehensive and complete record of how light interacts with this thing. So those are the kind of the three standard ways. And frankly, they've really, in the computer graphics literature, they've really dominated the approaches that have been taken. I think largely because people said, well, I better start with lots of generality uh, if I ever attempt to solve this problem. And surprisingly enough, um, the, the simple approach, which we call flash photography, and you'll see the term backscattering is a technical term for, for what we're doing in, a, in a, like recovering light that's reflected back from something. Um, but this frankly hasn't been that heavily studied. And in a nutshell, you could say that Michael Tetzlaff's dissertation in his research was building out all the pieces that are necessary to make this work well and make it work efficiently. And some of the, some of the contributions are 
not major, they're small, they're technical, they're just efficiency contributions. Some of them are bigger than that. But it's all about trying to you know, facilitate the use of some simple imaging devices that every one of us has in, their, in your pocket to produce really sophisticated pictures. Here's, um, here just to show you how this is accomplished. Uh, this is Charles Walbridge at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And he's photographing one of the statues in the gallery. And this is, you know, this is exactly how he went about acquiring the images with a flash camera uh, so that we could do an image, so we could construct some computer graphic images from it. Um, on the right-hand side, you see an example of one of those pictures. And if you, if you were to look at the pictures that were taken and that get taken for this process, individually, they don't look that good. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if when we've worked with the staff there and have talked and demonstrated this work to other museums across the country, um, and we show them the pictures, and the photographers go, man, you're telling me <laughs> that as a result of a day's work, I'm going to show some curator these pictures, I'd get fired, you know, because they just don't look like. On the other hand, they're pictures that anyone in this room could take, because that's the beauty of a flash camera, right? One of the beauties, one of the advantages, of, one of the reasons the flash camera is the way it is is because having that light on the camera itself makes it more, you're less error prone. You know, you're going to get something. <laughs> you know, you're going to get some kind of exposure. It may not be the best exposure, but if you use the automated system, we don't. So anyway, the, the point is that we, we, can't, we can't afford to burn out highlights. You know, we, if, we, if we overexpose and we start to lose detail in here, then where there's bright spots, then we've lost information. So we expose so that those highlights are nicely exposed. And obviously, that doesn't give you the kind of exposures that you might choose for, uh, for, for an image if you were just generally taking it, you know, if you were visiting the museum and, and taking a picture for you know, your, your own personal use. But these are the types of pictures that get taken. Um, you can also take some regular pictures without the flash or just statically illuminated to also uh, provide a more general documentation of the object. It doesn't all have to be done with flash. But this is, this is basically the approach. You have to take a lot of these pictures. It's not exactly a simple process. Um, and in fact, um, shortly after we started to work with the Art Institute, they acquired this gantry system. They're one of the few museums in the country that, you know, aside from the Getty and the, the Met, uh, MoMA, but there's not a lot of museums in the country that have a rig like this where you have, an auto, you have a robotically controlled camera and moving around an object and there's a turntable down there that's also a motorized and can be moved. You see these umbrella, this, this picture was taken well, just a general picture. These umbrellas, while they're, those umbrella lights, while they're on here for the purpose, while they're in the picture to begin with, they're not used when we're taking flash. And in fact, when Charles uses the rig, oftentimes he'll just mount a light, a photographic light on the camera itself instead of the flash because one of the, one of the issues, you know, that has to be overcome. If you shoot a lot of flash pictures, you know, you're going to burn out the battery burn out the device, right? So that's, that's, a, that's potentially a problematic aspect of this approach with a, with, a, with a traditional camera. It doesn't mean that you can't take some pictures today, you know, and, and then come back tomorrow and you know, do it over a period of time. Uh, but, but to avoid you know, just destroying the flash on, the, on a, an expensive camera, um, you might just mount a light on the camera. And you can do the same thing. So here's what you get. Um, Again, this is an artifact from their collection, the Ding. It's an example of some of their Chinese bronzeware. It's one of the real highlights of what the Minneapolis Institute of Art has. Um, and you do the photogrammetry. You get back this mesh. And then you can determine things like surface normals, we call them. Those are like little, little wires sticking away from the surface or, or wires that show what uh, orthogonal direction is. And so then... 
what we want to do is we want to get, remember again, we're not, we've already kind of covered the geometric aspect. This is all about the reflectance problem. And what we're going to use, what we hope to do is fit, fit, a, fit a, a model to the data that we're getting. And again, I'm not going to go into the mathematics of this and you know, the details of this, of this reflectance model. It's, it's not, not necessary anyway. But I do want to give you a sense of what it means. So this is a little uh, computer graphic depiction of what happens. So as you can imagine, this little area here in the middle is a piece of surface material. We have light coming in in the direction of the arrow. And this is kind of showing you the distribution of scattered light uh, from that point on the surface. And this number m is related to the surface roughness of the sample. So this is, this is a very rough piece of material when you have m is equal to, not, not, it's not super rough, but it's not, it's not obviously not reflecting in all directions like a specul like a diffuse object would. But as shiny things go, it's a fairly dull thing. And as you see the m value going down, the surface is getting shinier, and the light is reflecting more and more off into what we call the specular direction, which is essentially the mirror direction. And it's the equal and opposite direction to the lighting direction. So if we can, if we can figure out what this number m is for the materials that we're photographing, then we can plug it into this model, and we go to do the rendering process, right? And I have to do this lighting calculation that was part of that. I'll have my model, I'll have my m number, and I'll be able to um, you know, uh, calculate how the light interacts with the surface and produces the color on the surface of the object. So that's our goal. And the way we accomplish it is, again, we're going to take a bunch of pictures. We, and in this little test scene here, we have this brick. It's very scientific, a brick. And we have some color samples that are propped up on, on top of the brick. You know, use a brick so if somebody knocks the table, everything doesn't go kerfluey. So you, and, and a little color checker chart in there, which is really important for calibration. You need some reference. And the, the beauty of this approach, you know, the insight, and again, if you were going to talk about uh, uh, Michael, if you're going to characterize and summarize Michael Tutsloff's dissertation, it's all about taking advantage of the fact that when I use a flash camera, I automatically know where the light is. It's as simple as that. <laughs> I mean, in a nutshell, that's, that's the basic insight and the basic thing that he's, you know, and that's why this, one of the reasons this approach has so much of an advantage to it. You know, you, you, if you were to if you had to figure out where the lights were, and believe me, if you've done any computer vision work and you're handed a picture and you're trying to figure out where the lights were, it's not an easy problem to solve. It's a very hard problem to solve. So by definition, we know where the lights are. And, and secondly, there is this half angle vector that is the angle between uh, the direction that's halfway between the viewing direction, which is where the camera lens is, and where the light is. So you can compute that h sub i. And that's a really important parameter that'll show up over and over again as we, as we talk today. So we take all of our pictures. We do our photogrammetry. You know, we get back this representation of the brick and the color samples. And then we try and back out information that's going to help us determine the reflectance properties of, of those materials. So here's, you know, when I, when I consider the silver card, right, and if I'm looking directly at the silver card more or less, you know, the angle between my line of sight, the viewing direction, and the and the light source and the, and the orientation of that half angle with respect to the surface normal is very small. And you know, I'm like, this, this halfway angle 
in degrees is, is with respect to the surface normal. So this means that I'm looking you know, directly at the surface. And the color, you know, the pixel data, really tells me something about how much light is getting reflected from that point. And then if I look at you know, other pictures, which are taken from slightly different orientations, you know, it tells me more about, and I use the geometric conditions, it tells me more about the reflectance properties as I get farther away from you know, direct incidence of the light. It's just that simple. And then you do a fit to the data, and you find out that for this particular material, that silver card, M is equal to 0.29. So as you recall, that's not exactly a really shiny. It's not a mirror reflection. It's going to be kind of dull. Um, and again, I'm not saying that this idea is itself a novel contribution to do it this way. This is kind of where everybody started when they started to consider using pictures for this purpose. But what Michael's contribution here is, and I'm just going to spare you all the details, is because of the fact of the experimental setup with the camera and the flash attached to the camera and this half angle, uh, he's able to compute this in orders of magnitude less time than people who just kind of use a levenberg marquat brute force curve fitting algorithm. I mean, he's able to really get this to run super efficiently because of that insight. And here's a comparison that we've made with, with actual measure, measured uh, measurements of that card. Uh, here's another example, the, the gold paper. Get a slightly different reflectance uh, property comparison with real data or real measurements made with a you know, sophisticated Gonio, Gonio measurement device. And here's the, you know, the final result. So you see on the left the photograph that was taken. And you see on the right a rendering that was made using the process that was very similar to what I showed you, you know, the simple idea of looking through pixels, making a reflectance calculation. And, you know, more or less it's capturing kind of the, if you look at the shape and form of the specular highlights and where they fall, you know, we're getting pretty good correspondence. The texture comes from the software, or actually, well, take it back. The texture comes from the pictures uh, fed into this rendering system. But you can see, you know, while we used Agisoft Photoscan to get the geometry, by just being, by doing this additional calculation to get the reflectance, we now have a shiny thing, right? We don't have a dull thing that doesn't have the surface finish properties. And all we did was use the pictures to figure out the, the, the parameter for that reflectance model. Okay. So that, yeah, question, yep, yeah, sure. So this is probably done, uh, probably done with a ray tracer, and it's a pretty, in these days with a ray tracer, you know, you'd probably render that out in, in five or ten minutes max. Yeah, I mean, I mean you're, using a ray tracer is really even overkill for something like this because it's fairly simple. Yep. Um, does it get um, exponentially more complicated? So, like, this is a pretty smooth surface. If you're doing something that's, like, rough or has a lot of angles, is that... I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> because, yes, this doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work when you have something like this. Okay, so, so here's, here's, a, here's an example where, you know, we have this... You'll see more of this horse and rider statue uh, artifact in the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. You know, here's the actual picture that was taken of that area. And here's what we get back when we attempt to extract reflectance information and some other geometric information about that, about that area. So, so one of the problems is that the photo scan software, you know, you, you could buy a device amongst all the, you know, if you're willing to spend, money is no object, you know, you can find a scanner and one of the big problems, of course, is that this is highly reflective. If it's things that are really shiny are really problematic things to scan, no matter what your scanner is. But 
the photographs aren't going to recover the in the small tooling that was done by the artisan who made this thing. And if you compare this, this area here to this area here, you know, you know, I mean, this might be, might be good enough for a knockoff version of the statue that was going to be sold in the gift shop, right? But I mean, if you're really trying to document this thing and, and record it for, for history, you know, it's not good enough. So that's the way I have to solve now. Okay, so with that good question, I'll, I'll move on to, to how do we actually get that information. And, and what you see there is, is, is really a demonstration of the complexity of, of color appearance. So, for example, on the left, these are, there's a little uh, Chinese child's tiger hat in their collection, you'll see more of it. But it's a fabric, but it's not just a simple uh, uh, silk fabric. It's a fabric that has some metallicized threads in it that are going to reflect light different. And actually, there is, there is like silk in the orange part, and then there's some other type of fabric that's in the black part. So it's a, it's a really complex, both in terms of how the surface reflection varies, and also in terms of uh, from point to point, and also in terms of the basic material properties that are changing. This on the right is a, is a cloisonne altarpiece. It's also in their collection. Um, I've never seen it on display except once. <laughs> and they had a, they had an exhibit, while we were working with them, they had this, I don't know if you, if you saw the, the exhibit. Did anyone see the uh, Chinese? Um, uh, they had, a, had an exhibit where they uh, showed you artifacts from the collection, but you know, showing you what it was like to live in the, in the, in the uh, Forbidden City. Anybody see that? No one saw that. Okay. Well, it was pretty amazing. Anyway, in walking through it, they had this one room where they had a bunch of random artifacts from the collection all displayed on a, on a, on a rack, a very elaborate rack, just to kind of give you a sense, kind of blow you away with how much richness there was to living in that period of time and living in the Forbidden City. And on the bottom of the rack, I saw this thing. <laughs> I'd never seen it on exhibit. You know, and I thought, wow, I gotta have this. You know, <laughs> we gotta photograph this thing because it's got all this detail. It's perfect for what we're trying to do. And uh, anyway, the, the, the long and short of it is, you know, like two thirds of what they own is never on display. It's all it's almost typical for museums of that quality. You know, they just they don't have space to show it off. It's all in storage. Uh, but this cloisonne, if you know what cloisonne is, is little mat, bands of metal, and in the interstices between the bands of metal are porcelain and and other materials that get put in there, and so it creates this really complex and ever-changing reflectance pattern as you move across the surface. In addition, of course, it's got this kind of hand, this kind of tooling and, and working of the metal, you know, like the other object did. So we need another way. <laughs> we can't do it with, with the method I showed you. In fact, it's, it's almost very difficult to do, uh, even if you have access to really sophisticated scanning and acquisition equipment. So I'm going to show you, just like I showed you, a very kind of high-level, stylized approach to what is kind of traditional computer graphic rendering, making a picture of those little uh, squares and boxes. I'm going to motivate and try and, and show you how we get to the method that um, I'm going to demonstrate for the rest of the talk. And I'm going to use these, these little illustrations and cartoons that were done by a, by a friend of mine, Michael Cohen, who's actually the inventor of this method, and he used them in, in a tutorial that talk that he gave on this topic quite a few years ago, actually. So he hypothesizes that we have this thing, which is called Sue, which is a, 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 a thing, walk around, and, and it uses all of computer, it's, it's got the best computer vision algorithms built into it, and, and Sue scans the world and finds the geometric representation 
and the and and in addition, not only the geometry but also the reflectance. So Sue is walking around out there and acquires geometry and reflectance for using you know some magic algorithm for that purpose. And we have Bob graphics. I don't know why he made one a woman, another a man. I never never figured that one out. But anyway, Bob is a thing that walks around, and, and Bob is given the modeling information. He's got the geometry and the reflectance, and he can make the picture. And the way Bob does this is basically the way I described to you. He's got this model, just looks through pixels, does a lighting calculation, puts the color down, just the, just the way I described it to you. The way Sue works is takes at least two pictures of something, and then, again, using some algorithm, figures out the model part. Now, this is not a picture. It's a model. It's like data. It's triangles, reflectances. It's not a picture. It's data. And what we'd like to have is the combination of the two. We'd like to have Bob and Sue get together and work together to have this thing where we've got cameras that can take in the pictures of the world and pass them on to Bob, who's going to make a picture. And this is the device, the hypothetical uh, Shangri-La device that we would like to produce. Unfortunately, well, and, and so this is what this would look like. It was all put together. You'd have Sue up front in the pipeline, looking at the world, producing models, passing them to Bob. Bob takes the models and, and makes pictures. Unfortunately, even today, you know, vision technology is limited in terms of how it can acquire models of the world. Um, so it doesn't really get a complete geometric and, and surface reflectance uh, representation. It can do, as you can see from what I've shown you so far, just by doing photogrammetry, it could get a pretty good model of lots of things, but this kind of fuzzy object would give it, potentially give it some problems because of the fine-grained aspect that it has. And Bob, and, and at least at the time that this was, was done, his cartoon, he says, you know, Bob also has trouble because Bob can't do furry things like lions. Well, Bob can do this now, right? <laughs> That's a, the Lion King is, is a demonstration that, you know, this is now possible in computer graphics. So this, this part of it, you know, is not, is, isn't so true anymore. You know, graphics is really advanced to the point demonstrated by the Lion King that, you know, if you have a model, um, uh, you could actually render it in, in, in computer graphics today that had these kinds of properties. But the, 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 the problem is still on the front end. And it's on the front end that um, where the vision algorithms, while they can generate good examples of geometry, they can't get the reflectance information. And that's, that's just what, in all cases, that's just what I showed you, right? Where you have the saddle and the, and the elaborate hand tooling aspect of the saddle. You know, that, that part of it is beyond the capabilities of, of the vision part, which you know, I've tried to demonstrate to you in the early part of this talk. So what we're going to do is we're going to do what's called image-based rendering. So we're going to get some geometric representation, and then we're going to use the pictures themselves and combine them with the geometric representation to come up with, with images. And that's what is, is basically image-based rendering. So here's, here's how that works. So it started off, just a little bit of histor history of this, um, it was started with something called view-dependent texture mapping. You see these cameras that are 
positioned around the building, taking pictures. And then, given that you know the geometry of the building, you just map the data in the pictures back onto the surface. And if you do it carefully and you line everything up, you get back this version of the building from some novel vantage point. That's the whole point, is you, you want to make a picture from a point of view where you didn't take a picture. And you do this by interpolation. You, you, sort of typical way is I want to make a picture in the virtual view direction, and I have information in view one and view two, and I'm going to average that together in some way. And the way this was done is pretty simple. Um, I know the direction to the camera, I know the direction to the picture I want to make, and then I'm going to combine those pictures by some kind of weighting algorithm. And this was a small initial contribution that Michael made in conjunction with some graduate students that preceded him to improve this weighting uh, that was used prior to, prior to their uh, starting to work in this area, had better uh, computational properties, and just gave, in general, gave better results. And I'll show you a little video here of the results. see um, the processing with Agisoft. So here's, here's where all the cameras were located. This is an artifact also in the, in the Art Institute, um, uh, one of their Chinese bronzes. So you get the triangular mesh and then, so this is what you get back from Photoscan. It's just mapping their texture on and this is what you get once you put the, uh, put the original pictures on the surface. And you can see that you're getting a much better result. So, you know, our, our contribution besides the weighting function here was to just build a back end for photo scan so that given the pictures, you didn't, weren't stuck with the crummy texture that you got from photo scan and you, and you got something that had much better, much better appearance properties. So here's without, uh, this is with uh, Agisoft, and then <clears throat> there it is with the uh, original photographs. And all this is, this is, this is running at interactive rates. So, you know, the, you see the cursor moving around, it's manipulating the object in real time. Um, all this is, you know, done at, done at interactive rates. Object that uh, this is actually in the Goldstein here at, in, uh, in the Design College here on the University of Minnesota campus. This kind of outrageous fabric hat. Um, here's if you look at this. This again comes out of Agisoft. You have to look carefully at this one, but there's some metallicized uh, 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 fabrics in here. Once we'll, we'll get a close up. So the, the switch to the unstructured lumograph isn't quite as dramatic here. There's a close-up that comes a little bit. You can see that a little bit better. So here's, here you can actually see the sheen in the fabric and, and the metallicized backing that's in this. OK. So you know our, our contribution here, besides the, the weighting function, was to actually point out, you know, and this, 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 for some reason, had, had not been realized by people. There wasn't really great communication between the people in computer graphics and the people who were doing this photogrammetry work. I mean, there's tons of this work that gets done in cultural heritage. And they almost always are stuck with the results of Agisaw Photoscan. And we just showed that, wow, you can use this as a front end and feed that information into this algorithm, we didn't, we, we, which we modified slightly. But, but moving on to uh, you know, some real contributions, um, 
here's, here's the idea again that we're, we're exploiting. Is when we take a flash picture, we know where the light is, and therefore we can compute this half angle vector. And one of the insights that Michael had, that as far as we could tell had been neglected, was the way that you really want to weight the photographs is not by the angle between the viewing directions. You really want to weight them according to the difference in the half angle. And again, I'll spare you the technical details, but what it boils down to is this. The model, the reflectance model, almost all the reflectance models, the one I showed you, the Torrance model, are all parameterized by the half angle. And the reason they parameterize them that way is because that's the most efficient and effective way to do it. And it's the best way to capture the properties of the reflectance, is to use that as a parameterization. So we should use that here for the same reason. If you want to pull, if you want to really weight the photographs effectively, you should weight them according to this, this half angle angle. And, and what it also allows, and again, we didn't invent the idea of, of relighting these things, but what it does permit is you then can relight the object, not only just capture its shape and form and have some static representation of its appearance based on the original photographs, you can actually go in and shine lights on it from different directions and, and see what it might look like if you, you know, if you change the lighting conditions. This is a little, the little child's hat from the Art Institute collection. And you're getting, you know, you can get the shadows and you know, really, really sort of appreciate the appearance properties of the materials that are in it. Um, if you just look at how the light plays over the surface of that orange silk, you know, that's a fairly complex uh, material uh, representation that, that, that silk has. Silk has really almost metallic-like properties to it. So a final uh, addition to this system is to exploit what's called environment map-based lighting. And I don't know if you've ever seen one of these little cameras. It's a Ricoh, um, Ricoh camera. This is a Theta, Theta S, it's called. Uh, but if you look at it in profile, um, it, it, has, it has a fisheye lens on either side. So if I, were to, if I were to hold that up in this room, for example, it would give you a comprehensive documentation of almost every surface and thing and point in this room. So it's a pretty cool thing. I mean, you can, you're like, you know, if you want to be a real lazy photographer, <laughs> you just walk into the room, snap one of these, and then you do it all in post. You know, you come home and, and figure out what part you're, <laughs> you really want to do. It's actually, you know, you could, you could travel that way. Uh, so... So you, you take these pictures, and, and here's, here's an example. Not necessarily taken with that device. You can, you can do this a lot of ways. You can put a chrome ball in the middle of the room and photograph the chrome ball from two sides. You get the same result. You can use a fisheye lens, and you're going to shoot in one direction with the fisheye lens and then shoot in the other direction and then merge the stuff together. And there's software available that will you know, facilitate this process. It's not, uh, not an idea that we invented. Um, but it allows you, you know, for example, here's the art gallery, and here's a gallery in the Art Institute. You know, here's an outside scene. I don't think we took this one. It's, it was just available online. You can even do things like, you know, you can, so you can design studio lighting setups. And this is a really crude example, but if you think about it, it's like an umbrella light gets spread out. And you can even buy or, or you know, or, 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 or a piece of software which will allow you to design an environment map using actual photographic lights. So you don't even have to have a photographic studio. You can have a virtual, professional photographic studio. You know, if you have this, this tool to build your environment maps, and then you have the necessary rendering software. So it's very powerful. I mean, if you can imagine. Uh, and, 
we do here is we take the environment map and we pixelate it, call it MIP mapping. So we're just averaging it down to kind of this form. And what we're going to do is then we're going to relight the object. And each one of these little squares is going to contribute light to the object that we're trying to represent. And again, remember, this is what we did when we had a discrete light, L prime up here. We average based on the half angle. And now that we've surrounded this object completely with an environment map so that it's being lit from all directions, what we do is, again, we use the half angle. So if you watch this, watch where L goes. It just flips over across. So it's pointing in the opposite direction, equal and opposite direction relative to the half angle. And we do a one-time calculation. Again, this is, this is Michael's contribution. This is a novel idea to go around and sum up and, and figure out what the weighted, what, what would each piece of that environment derezzed contribute. And then we're going to weight the photographs for the same reason that we did the half angle weighting before. We're going to weight all the photographs that way. And what that allows us to do then is relight things by environment maps. So this is that Cloisonne altarpiece from the Art Institute. And it's, here it is in an outdoor garden setting. You can move the object relative to the environment or the uh, environment relative to the object. Here's a, a second outdoor scene, more of a dense foliage. I mean, you can even, you, if you just were looking at the object, you can almost appreciate what the lighting conditions are uh, as they change. And, the, and so the, the power of this is, you know, if you're a curator, you can actually figure out, well, what would the thing look like if I put it here in the gallery or there in the gallery? What if I change the lighting in the gallery instead of the lighting that's currently in the gallery? If it's a historical artifact that's sitting in the gallery, well, what the heck does it look like? It was never indoors when it was actually you know, on site. What does it look like when it's outdoors? Or what does it even look like on a particular day and, and year in history? Because you can remodel where the sun and everything else was and just find out where the sun was relative to the object. All those things are, are possible you know, when you use this kind of environment-based, uh, image-based relighting uh, using environment maps. And at some point here, you'll see the, uh, we're going to go, now we're going to go in and, and do some discrete lighting, just to sort of, it's a little bit more obvious what's going on. Uh, and this is, a, this is a piece of software that's, you know, we are making available. Uh, it's available, if we don't provide the source yet, but, you know, you could go out and download this and do this yourself. Everything I've showed you, you could do yourself. I mean, you could, you could. Take all the pictures. You could run it just off PhotoScan. You could take the results, feed it into our software, and do this yourself, just like this. And so the interface allows you to play with discrete lights, relight the, relight the object in various ways. But you can see that you know, it's all done so this is all done with images and the basic geometry uh, uh, of the object. And we did some kind of uh, validation here. So you know, if you take the object and you do like a ray trace, if you have a, you know, the, what you think is a reasonable representation of its geometry and reflectance, and then you ray trace it, and then you compare it to doing image-based rendering just to sort of do a little bit of validation. All right, the final thing I want to want to talk about here is, you know, so so we have this we have this method, right? And it's been we didn't invent image-based rendering. We made some contributions and, and additions to it. But one of the problems that's existed since the beginning of this method is the question, how many pictures do you need? Right? How many pictures do you really need? You don't want to take any more pictures than are really necessary. You only want to take the minimal set. And this is an area where there's nothing 
maybe one paper that's ever tried to answer this, provide any insight into this question. And the, and the basic problem here is that there's, there's, when you have a really shiny object like this metallic automotive finished uh, shape, it's able to actually image the light sources uh, that are in the scene. So you can see the fluorescent tubes here. You can see the overhead chandelier or whatever it was. On the other hand, if I have an object like these slippers, which are also shiny, they're metallicized fabric, they don't do anything with respect. You know, you could, you could never figure out what the lighting was. Here you might be able to guess what the lighting conditions were. And the problem that causes in this image-based rendering is when I want to make this picture on the right-hand side, but I only took 103 photographs of it with a robot, hopefully, you get this result. If you take more pictures, you, know, you, you start to be able to average things together and approach this, this spot. But even with 500 photographs, you never quite get there, right? On the other hand, if you work with this artifact, another thing, this is the artifact from the Art Institute, you can do as, as few as 56 photographs. And it looks just fine. You go to 240, it looks, you know, it's indecipherable. You would never see it. And we, you know, we came to understand this. We, we even, because of experience, we, we could look at something and go, oh, that'll work, that won't work, that'll work. We had no way of actually deciding whether it's going to work or not. And, and so this was the final part of Michael's work, <clears throat> was to come up with some way of quantifying this. So to be, you know, to sort of break it down a little bit. <clears throat> so on the top row, you see uh, these are all synthetic objects that were you know, model to try and excite some of these problems. But do it in a way, you know, we didn't have to run around and collect a bunch of things to study this. You know, that's one of the beauties of working in computer graphics. You know, we can make virtual versions of things to try and understand some of these problems. And you can see that the image-based rendering, which is the top, looks very similar to what you see on the bottom. But then on the other hand, you know, when you pick objects like these, Really shiny things, are the ding artifact, you know, even, even things that might not look problematic, a golf ball, kind of shiny golf ball thing. Um, I mean, this is what it's supposed to look like. That's how it got rendered. And this, this is you know, extremely problematic. Look at that. This is, what, this is what it should look like on the bottom and, and what it looked like with 34 pictures on the top. And you can study this and again, kind of build these matrices. So across the top, you have surface finish going from very smooth, almost mirror-like on the left to something that's you know, not you know, somewhat dull on the right. And in the vertical, you've got numbers of pictures. And you can see that it, you know, the more pictures you have, the better you do. And the less shiny the thing is, the better you do, right? And if you think about this problem kind of in a pictorial way, what you're really trying to get a handle on is this problem of the highlight overlap. So if you have something that's got this surface reflectance property, and we're kind of, this is like the profile of the highlight. So this is something that's, you know, somewhat shiny, it's got fairly focused highlight. And it's very difficult, you're not going to be able to interpolate between these pictures to get the highlight to be here. That's the, that's the basic problem. On the other hand, if you have something that's a little rougher, you can potentially do it. You know, because what you have to, the, the error that you're going to get isn't going to be as great. There's going to be some error, but it won't be as great. On the other hand, you go back to the original surface finish and just get more pictures. And you can see, you know, again, your, your ability to figure it out, to interpolate it, goes up with more pictures. 
So what it really amounts to is this difference. And if I look at <clears throat> this photo here at, in the middle of its highlight, and I go to the adjacent picture, and I look at the same pixel, which because of the you know, fact that the highlight moves over the surface, it's not gonna, the highlight isn't there you know, in that location, in that picture. So I have this huge difference. And that, that's an indicator of a problem. Whereas for the surface that doesn't have the shininess, that difference right there goes down. And similarly, when I add more pictures, you know, that difference at that pixel in the middle of the highlight goes down. Further complicating the problem is the fact that for things like that horse and rider statue, there's all these bumps and textures where the individual surface itself might have this reflectance surface piece, but then when you uh, add the bumps and all the rest of it to it, you get this kind of uh, pattern of, of highlights that are scattered around. So, and when you uh, take out the surfaces, when you, if you don't even have a way of identifying which surface is which, the problem gets even worse. So here's uh, the condition in that where you have this surface that's all broken up and you have this difference here. And you can still find it, but it's going to just be scattered around. So here's the upshot and the final uh, result. So basically his algorithm takes the difference between two images, two adjacent images, and by doing that, he, he's able to essentially isolate the highlight. So the more pictures you have, the closer the pictures are together. So in a, in a, when you're taking a difference between two pixels, it's likely that the adjacent one might have the highlight right there too if you took enough pictures, and this will get smaller. Uh, if the surface is smoother, again, the adjacent picture is likely to have some aspect of highlight in it, and that difference goes down. If you have a roughened surface, you'll get the same effects for more pictures and change in surface reflection. In addition, you'll get this sort of breakup due to the individual faceting. And here's what that looks like when you plot it. So for this object, you know, you see that the pattern of the difference, if you look at those, those difference values that are, that are being calculated and you, and you plot them, you know, they're kind of spread out as you get farther away from specular, but they're still relatively clustered uh, in that area. On the other hand, something like this uh, shiny ding vessel, um, it has a very much more uh, organized and very tightly clustered pattern. And when you have the statue here, you see that because of all that randomness, it really gets spread out. So what he did was he took this data, used principal components analysis to plot the <clears throat> little graphic that you see there. And he came up with a heuristic. He says, well, you know, if the principal axis, if I project that down onto here, and I get something, the bigger it is, the worse the condition. The smaller the projection, the better the condition. So here, that's worse. Here, it's far better. And from that, derived a metric, which you, you know, if you just test it casually like this, you'd need a perceptual test of some kind to really nail it down. But you know, casually, on, some pre on a pretty robust set of data, you can see that you know, things that are like 80% and above render pretty well. And you can see some of the artifacts that we've already looked at in that. Whereas things that are 70% you know, or below are problematic. And so you, know, you see the ding in here with fewer photographs and more photographs. 
So this is dependent on the number of photographs you have. So anyway, you could use this potentially to both tell you about the quality of the image and to actually you know, help you take more photographs or less photographs. You could anticipate a robotic algorithm where the thing takes a few photographs, runs a calculation, says, oh, you know, good enough, you know, or no, you need more photographs, so it continues to, to shoot some more photographs. All right, so I just want to finish with this little piece of animation. And what this also demonstrates to you, and again, we didn't, this is nothing that we invented, but it, but it shows you the, the power of having access to data recorded this way. If you, this is a computer graphic. It's not made with you know, a movie camera. If you were going to tell somebody, a curator, you know, I'm going to run this robotically controlled camera in this path around this artifact and get this close to it, and you're not holding the camera, you know, you get some questions. But, but you can do that with this virtual setup, right? It's, it's just, there's no problem. Okay. So just to summarize, the advantages of the approach, <clears throat> simple equipment, and just uh, cheap flash cameras. It's a simple procedure that you know, anybody can do. Um, it, it allows you to, once you've done the photography, you don't have to have a photographic studio. You can use a virtual lighting and, and a virtual photography setup. Um, you can introduce things like environment-based lighting, which allow you to put the object into environments. And you can do these, these kinds of animations, um, which, which you really can't do with real cameras. And finally, you know, one, of the, one of the things about this is actually nice from a, from a museum standpoint. You know, if, you, if you get the job from the curator to, to photograph this thing in a certain way, you're making catalog pictures. Well, you know, five years later, if somebody else comes along and says, well, I, I need to shoot it this way, you don't have to put the artifact back on, you know, handle the artifact again. You can just go back to the pictures and, and virtually reshoot the pictures in a different way. So it has that kind of advantage. And finally, I just want to, again, give uh, credit to the student, Michael Tetzlaff, who did this work, and our colleagues at uh, the Art Institute. So thank you. Any questions? I'm guessing you used the fixed exposure for all of your images? Yeah. Did yeah. you do anything with like high, dan high dynamic ranging? To no, we haven't. That's, a, that's a good nails. question. You know, that's a, a, a potential opportunity is to, is to integrate uh, aspects of high dynamic range in, imaging into this, where you're going to be able to capture the whole range of intensities. But no, we don't do that right now. Like in terms of the fine detail of the 3D geometry model. Yeah, so I mean, I, I I personally can't put a number on it, but you know, it's it's uh, millimeter kind of. I would I would say can't capture like the little tooling marks that are in the yeah. saddle, but the ridges around the outside it could. Okay, thanks a lot.